So good evening. Um, my name is Michael Carroll. I am a professor of law and uh, co-director of our program on information justice and intellectual property here at American University Washington College of Law. Um, welcome to our IPN Tech at the Supreme Court series, uh, which we've now been running for uh, more than 10 years in which we invite counsel involved in IP and tech cases uh, heard by the Supreme Court to come and join us on the afternoon of oral or argument to help us understand uh, what's going on in the case and what we can learn from the uh, argument today. Uh, brief apologies to those online. Um, there are some of our co-panelists who are still stuck in traffic here in the real world, <laughs> in the physical world. So uh, we had to start a little bit late and they'll be joining us and we'll be uh, weaving them into the conversation <coughs> as they do. Um, uh, I'll, I'll introduce the folks that we have with us um, and then as they come, I'll try to introduce them as well. Um, so to my immediate right is uh, Jeremy Brogy. Uh, did I say it right? I'll stop. Uh, <laughs> who's a partner at Wiley Ryan um, and, and filed a friend of the court brief on, on behalf of the National Republican Senatorial Senate Committee uh, in support of, well, you're on different sides in this case. But, in case. Yes, the basic, okay. Um, and um, uh, he's litigated constitutional and statutory and regulatory issues in, in the federal and, and uh, state courts. Um, and to his, sorry, uh, your uh, Jennifer. Jennifer, thanks, I apologize. Um, okay, so to his right, we have Jennifer uh, Sastrom, who is the director of the Stanton Foundation First Amendment Clinic, uh, who filed a friend of the court brief, brief uh, on behalf of First Amendment Clinics, citizens and journalists in support of um, well, you're on both sides as well, and she, you, she's at Vanderbilt uh, Law School um, and uh, uh, was a Dunn Fellow at the ACLU, where she litigated federal and state courts um, and served as counsel to the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection at Georgetown Law Center um, as well. Um, to her right is Tori Ferris, who is an associate at Fletcher, Filco, Shadi, and Francis, one of the attorneys representing uh, respondent James Freed. She handles a variety of civil litigation matters, including insurance, defense, civil rights, labor, employment, and commercial matters. Uh, and thank you for joining us. To her right is Stephanie Joyce, Senior Vice President and Chief of Staff at the Computer uh, and Communications Industry Association. Um, and in conjunction with NetChoice, the Cato Institute and the Chamber of Progress, CCIA filed uh, briefs in both cases in support of neither party. Um, and to her right is Bob Corn Revere, uh, who is a, a part of the litigation team at the Foundation for Individual Rights and uh, Expression, FIRE, uh, who submitted amicus briefs on both sides. Um, uh, and he, he is a, a prominent writer, thinker, and advocate on free expression issues, um, and recently published a book called The Mind of the Censor and the Eye of the Beholder, The First Amendment and the Censor's uh, Dilemma. Uh, to his right, his, who just joined us is- Donna Orr. Donna Orr. Welcome, Donna. Sorry for oh, the no, delay. No, sorry. <laughs> um, Donna is an associate at Arnold Porter and one of the uh, attorneys representing uh, petitioner uh, Kevin Linke, and she um, focuses her practice on white collar defense and investigations, appellate matters and US sanctions. Um, and we have a few others who will, will join us. Um, so this case arises because public officials are people too. And people use social media um, and they use social media in their personal capacities and sometimes they talk about work. So what happens and under what circumstances can a public official's use of their personal social media account uh, violate the, the First Amendment. And we're not here to address that overall question. Instead, we're here to address a sub, a, a, a sub question, which is under what circumstances should the public officials actions in relation to their personal social media account be deemed to be quote unquote state action. Um, and why that matters is because constitutional rights are rights against the state um, and state action is a requirement uh, in a First Amendment claim. So there are other requirements in that claim that are not at issue at this point. We've, everything's been narrowed to just this one question. 
Uh, what's the law? Well, the overall law is that you have state action when the actions can be, quote unquote, fairly attributable to the state. Um, and that test often arises when uh, a, a litigant is trying to hold a private party uh, it, to be acting in state action and therefore in violation of their constitutional rights. So this is a little bit of the flip side. Uh, are uh, the folks who are uh, sort of defending against the claims are public officials. So they are employed by the state. Uh, the question is, uh, does, does that mean everything they do, is that fairly attributable to the state? Of course not. So where, where's the line? And that's the, the basic issue in this case. Uh, and so unlike some cases in which it, the issue rule of application and conclusion is about applying the law to exi existing facts, this is really about what is the law in this context. We, you know, this fairly attributable standard is quite general and the court has to give lower courts and public officials and others guidance as to where the lines are in terms of when uh, constitutional rights attach to uh, people interacting. And most of the facts in these cases and including these involve um, people who wanna comment on public officials' uh, social media posts or threads, um, and then either individual comments are hidden, deleted, or else their accounts are blocked. And so the claim is essentially that you are uh, picking and choosing among my members of the public as to who you communicate with, and that's in violation of my First Amendment rights to talk to you as a public official. So that's... Um, so we have a school board member from uh, 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 California who is the, the president of the school board who ran a Facebook uh, page or runs a Facebook page uh, that communicates uh, pretty often and frequently about school, school board activities. Um, uh, and then we have uh, a city manager from the city of Port Huron, uh, Michigan, who has since deleted his account uh, but uh, was also uh, talking about city business and what's going on in the city. Um, and uh, in both cases, the claims arise because uh, critics of, of these public officials uh, had, the, you know, had their ability to talk back essentially on social media blocked in one way or the other. So that, that's the short version of what's going on. Um, and in terms of the, the law, we're gonna hear and I'm gonna ask more about you know, what, what, what are the options on, on the table? Um, but in the lower courts, the Ninth Circuit uh, said, well, the way you tell whether a social media account uh, is fairly attributable to the state is when you look at the appearance and the, and the content of the, of the page. So if it looks like an official page, if it talks about official uh, uh, business, then that's the kind of evidence that would make this state action. The Sixth Circuit said, no, we need a much more formal type test uh, because this gets really messy and we'll have a flood of litigation. So unless, there, unless the use of the private social media account involves the public official's duty and authority, and you're gonna hear a lot about those words, they got a lot of a work, they got a big workout today at oral argument. Um, unless it arises from duty and authority, then it is private action, it's not state action, the First Amendment claim goes away. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, and I guess we do have uh, uh, counsel from two of the parties on the panel that I guess I'll, I'll ask you to tell us your story first, and then I'm gonna go right into the conversation about the argument um, be, because uh, of our late start. So Tori, let me start with you. Tell us a little bit more about your client and anything about my recap that you disagree with or, and tell us at this point just sort of what you argued in your brief. Sure. Um, so my client is about, uh, he's like 36 years old. So he was in college in 2008 when Facebook first came out, like back in the day, you had to have a .edu email address to even be on part of Facebook. So he opens the account and he gets over 5,000 friends eventually because back in those days, <laughs> I was in college, you added basically everyone in all of your college classes, and he grew too popular before he came to the city of Port Huron. So he was an avid social media user. He used it to show pictures of his dog, his daughter, literally hundreds of pictures of his daughter, um, pictures of what he ate that day. He would post things about the city, but he never made any official announcements. He never took any official action. He wasn't hosting city council meetings or anything like that. 
He was merely sharing information that any other Facebook user could have shared from another site. Um, so he, in the petitioner in this case, has a lengthy criminal history of felonious assault, um, cyber stalking, violating PPOs, and had a reputation of harassing people in the community. Um, and quite reasonably, my client just did not want this individual on his page, much like he has done in the past. He had deleted comments from people who he thought were also creepy, or he just didn't like what they said. He, he treated it like his private Facebook account. Um, so he deleted his comments and, and the lawsuit followed. And it was really that he had to deal with this litigation. He was being sued. He had no idea what the test was to decide whether or not he wanted his actions would be state action. So he just deactivated the page and he no longer spoke to his friends, family, the people he met in college. He, he didn't speak at all anymore. Uh, so we won in the lower court, which uh, in the district court, they applied with the test that petitioner uh, for which they're advocating now. Um, so my belief is we went under either test. The Sixth Circuit then uh, argued that it needs to be tied to a state duty or authority. And we won under that test because Mr. Freed was never exercising any authority of his position and he was never exercising any duty on behalf of the state. Um, so that was our argument that we, we think the duty and authority test makes the most sense because you would use objective criteria like whether the government employee is using government resources or government funds or the account belongs to the state rather than this type of amorphous test uh, for which petitioner is advocating that looks at appearance and function. Great. Um, and then Donna, let me uh, ask you to tell us about your, your client, your sure. position. So I think I'm going to go a little less in detail on the facts because ultimately the, the question presented was a legal question. My client is, or our client is Kevin Linke. He's a uh, resident of Port Huron, a small town in Michigan. And he engaged uh, or attempted to engage with Mr. Freed, the city manager about specifically the city's COVID response um, during the relevant time. The activity on the page was more heavily uh, had a, a heavier governmental tilt, if you will, um, during the COVID pandemic. And he, uh, his comments, uh, Mr. Freed deleted his comments and then blocked him from the page. Um, so that's just kind of a little bit in the way of, of facts. Uh, and the, the question you heard what the question was in our position is that if a state official or a public official uh, purports to act in his official capacity, then he is a state actor when he does so. That's in a nutshell what we argued. Um, the, the whole uh, kind of appearance and function versus duty or authority, um, it, it's a little bit, they're not in 100% tension because our position is that it's not that you are not, you may not take account of duty and authority, you certainly may. And you should, it's just that the Sixth Circuit erred in its rejection of um, appear, or, or the relevance of appearance and function to the question of state action. Great. Um, so um, and I'm gonna ask uh, our friends of the court here to, to start and then let the party council get back in. But uh, first I just wanna, I have to say, I read the briefs, I follow, I, well, I listened to the argument. I honestly don't know if I followed it because um, there, there were so many different flavors of tests that were out there and I was trying to keep score. So we've got sort of the narrow version of duty and authority. And then we've got a lot of sort of maybe ways in which duty could be interpreted more broadly. We've got appearance and content. The Garnier's position is if they are doing their job. So if the activity that you're complaining about is part of the official's job, whether they're using private resources or not, then, um, uh, then that is state action. So there's, there's the legal test. The other question that I want to get to is this issue of what does the test apply to? Does it apply to the entire account? Does it apply to individual communications? But let's just sort of start with 
what are the options for the court? Because the court more than once sort of said, help me write this opinion, finish this sentence. <laughs> a public official engages in state action when dot, dot, dot. And they got different answers and I didn't write them all down. So duty and authority, appearance and function or appearance and content, what else, what else is on the table and, and doing the job? Are there any other sort of magic words that were offered? Uh, Private property versus public. Okay, uh, right, a, a straight up formal distinction. If it's a, if it's a private property, it's, pr it's private behavior. Although I think the Solicitor General characterized it as a gloss on the duty and authority test. It's kind of a, a yeah. hybrid. Yeah. Um, Today they took that position. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He also yes. backed off it with some speed when poked, but he opened with private property yeah. akin to one's backyard that one may lawfully exclude a person from intruding on their backyard. About an hour and a half into the argument, he understood that that black letter test might be too strict. Um, and then he, he, he did veer and pivot more to duty. Yeah, so was my I, I think that's exactly right. It was, here's a simple formalist test. Okay, you don't want that. <laughs> let's, let's bold. Other, so any, uh, well, let me ask this other question that occurred to me is, um, you know, as lawyers, when we, you know, and, and I'm assuming this to be true, but we're always drawing lines about in what capacity are we acting. So you get up in, in, in a panel like this and you make it clear that I'm just speaking uh, for myself and I'm not speaking on behalf of my client. Or, you know, I'll say I'm speaking it, you know, if I'm a member of a nonprofit board and I'll say, well, I'll talk about the organization, but I'm not talking about the organization in my capacity as a board member. And we, as lawyers, use that vocabulary of in, in that capacity. But that doesn't seem to be the language, like I'm just looking for the magic words. And why are these other magic words more appealing than, than official, you know, acting in the capacity, in the official capacity? Because then we'd be focusing on what do you mean by capacity? And in some ways that, I don't know, that feels to me like that would be a better place to be. But obviously those of you who've litigated the case know that that's not where the courts want to go. So just help me understand that. Well, before we get to trying to figure out what the answer is or, or what answer the court was groping for today, uh, I, I think it helps to better define the question or the problem they're trying to solve. Because this didn't start, this issue didn't start with these two cases. It started earlier and in its largest manifestation with former President Trump, where he was using Twitter to the exclusion of offices within the White House and almost exclusively to announce foreign policy, to announce domestic policies, to do his own, um, uh, his own press, uh, to um, um, go after critics. Um, and so it became essential, essentially an integral part of the White House operation, even though it started out as his private account. And so the question is, at what point does a government official's use of a private forum become uh, state action for purposes of constitutional analysis? And how much freedom does a public official have to block critics when they do that? The two cases today presented different fact patterns, but essentially the same question. And so everyone agrees that at some point, the use of a private account becomes state action. And so the question today, and I don't know that we really got a hint at what the answer is going to be, uh, is what is the right test? Now, I think the court was not particularly impressed with the answer the Sixth Circuit gave, and that is the um, um, actual, or apparent, uh, actual or apparent authority test. That is essentially, that's just defining state action. If you've uh, passed a, a, a law that says you're going to have this website, even if it's your personal one for government purposes, that's sort of formal state action. Um, on the other hand, the court was uncomfortable with the approach that has been taken by the majority of circuits, and that is the function or appearance test or multi-factor test. And so it was looking for some way to answer that question. And you saw various levels of concern coming from different, uh, different justices on the bench. Yeah. And Jennifer, what, what was your takeaway on this? 
I think it was uh, interesting that the conversation was both um, kind of so technical in terms of trying to define certain terms. What falls within the duty bucket? Does it have to come from statute? Does it have to come from uh, a manual? Does it have to come from customer practice? And how do we define that? Um, it, I think was both incredibly technical, but then also incredibly muddy. I thought the parties, um, and sometimes the justices were talking around each other and how to define those terms and sometimes talking about concepts without really, um, you know, uh, grounding them in some of the practical implications of how social media is used by people. So even the question you raised of, are we looking at a page or post? It kind of depends. So maybe on an individual post um, about, you know, uh, an, a certain official's, uh, you know, cat uh, that the justices raised during argument, you know, might, uh, it, there might not be a constitutional harm if a comment is deleted from that. But if a user is then blocked from accessing the entire page because the official did not like the post about the cat, then they can't see not just the post about the cat, but all of the other policy decisions that are maybe being posted on the page. So even the, the idea of toggling between kind of thinking about the page as a whole, how it is used, what, what, what it means to be blocked and thus not able to see the page entirely versus having a specific comment blocked or removed was even, I, you know, I think something that, um, you know, wasn't drilled down on enough in terms of how it connects with some of these definitions and how we also connect those definitions to practical use of how uh, folks use the internet these days. Great, thanks. And we've been joined by Peter Fagan, who submitted an amicus brief on behalf of the California School Boards Association in support of uh, petitioners. So welcome, uh, Peter. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, let me ask you for your uh, impressions since you filed in both cases as well. What do you, um, and, and, and tell us a little bit about uh, your client's interest in, in this issue. Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, the, uh, yeah, the, I've represented the National Republican Senatorial Committee, um, which is um, the, the committee that represents elected Republicans in the U.S. Senate. So they are government officials who use social media both for uh, official purposes and they have official accounts to, to do that. And they also use it... Um, uh, for personal purposes, but particularly for campaigning. And so one of the things that we wanted to bring to the court's attention and one of the fun things about it being amicus counsels, you don't have to solve every issue in the case. Uh, but one of the things we wanted to bring to their attention is the importance of the political speech that uh, the candidates and elected officials who may not be candidates at the time, but who will be in the future uh, are, are making on the pages. And related to that, um, for those officials, a clear test is important because they need to know, hey, when I, mon when I moderate content on my page, um, am I going to be liable for that because I'm a state actor? Or am I, like I think I am, um, putting out my own image and brand and I don't want to be associated with certain comments that people are making? Uh, and so... I I was pleased to see how many, how few takers there were on the court for the Ninth Circuit's test, which, you know, is very ambiguous and hard to apply in practice. Um, you know, the advantage, like all multi-factor tests, is that, you know, if there's a particular fact in the case that seems important, you can write the opinion that way. But the problem with it is that when you're on the outside trying to predict ahead of time what the court will do, it's almost impossible. Uh, but then, of course, as we, you know, even though the justices seem to be favoring the Sixth Circuit's language. We got, as you mentioned, all the discussion about what do we mean by authority? Does that mean custom? Does that mean when you run into your neighbor at the supermarket and you're expected to talk about government positions, does that now transform that into state action and those kinds of things? So that's maybe a little bit, a little bit broad, but yeah, okay, thanks. Um, and, and Stephanie, it, you didn't you filed in, in support of neither party, but you're representing essentially the platforms. Uh, or you, and, and so the platforms are kind of talked about, but not you know in, in the case itself. So uh, what was your take on it in terms and, and from the platform's perspective, what, if anything, do they want out of the court in this context? Yes, so I should say to those in the room, I'm dressed today as Switzerland. <laughs> uh, CCAA, NetChoice, the Cato Institute, and the Chamber of Progress 
got involved as amici in support of neither party, precisely because of the issue that uh, Professor Carroll just raised, which is what happens to the digital service companies, which is the term we employ, when an individual is successfully sued as a state actor for something they put on X or Facebook or any other number of, of sites. And in a word, our collective position was, leave us out of this, please. <laughs> as a litigator in a former position, I have argued state action approximately 64 times. I have a lot of feelings about state action, but when you're speaking about a service that is not a procured via a pro government procurement process, it's not a contractor to the government and has its own editorial rights and judgment and its own terms of service, they must be kept apart from this question. They must not be dragged into this litigation, nor should any court issue a decision that would make it appear that a state official had commandeered the site and somehow taken over the site and made the site into a state instrumentality. And that was the purpose of our rather short amicus brief was simply uh, to show up and be counted in order not to be counted. <laughs> and in terms of your impressions of, of the argument today, where, where, do you, where did you see the court gravitating towards in terms of the test? Neither ninth nor sixth. Uh, Bob and I are discussing before the panel, they're Goldilocks. They're gonna do something <laughs> right in the middle. And again, speaking as Stephanie Joyce Esquire, not on behalf of CCIA, but just as an attorney and an interested person, I find exclusivity to be an important factor. And I think that's where Justice Kavanaugh was going. That's why he was focusing on this phenomenon of reposting. Um, it strikes me that when you're talking about the tension between the First Amendment rights of the official vis-a-vis -vis their constituents, well, let's talk about the constituents' rights. And I would have loved a little more discussion about, and, and forgive me, I didn't read all the briefs, perhaps there, was, perhaps there was discussion in the briefs, but isn't this really about, have citizens truly been denied the right to petition the government for redress, or is information posted someplace else such that the state official's personal site is simply superfluous. I think that argument seemed attractive to Justice Kavanaugh and perhaps attractive to others of the justices. I do hope there's some discussion of that because it strikes me as a little excessive to reach a holding that any speech about state policy, no matter if it's the first or 1,001st instance of it, converts the speech into state speech. And therefore, whoever uttered or typed those words is a state actor who can be sued under Section 1983. That's pretty terrifying. So I do hope that they um, latch onto that in the opinion, because frankly, I found the sophistric argument about duty versus authority to be distracting and unnecessary. And I think petitioner's counsel was to me very persuasive when he explained that the appearance test is difficult because what about in his example, the off duty policeman who pushes somebody down, but he's off duty. A thousand people viewing the scene of the policeman pushing someone down might think that is state action. It isn't. So uh, I think the appearance test can be um, a little over-inclusive uh, and I think rooting it in duty and the force of law to me is an important, an important factor in the test. Okay. Um, so Peter, tell us about your clients and what you took from the argument today. Uh, thank you. And sorry, I was late. Uh, took longer than I thought. Um, I represent California School Boards uh, Association, CSBA, and it's a nonprofit organization of approximately a thousand school boards in the state of California. And so each school board has a, between five and seven people. So over 5,000 people. Um, and what I do as my job is I do lots of governance training for school board members. And every training 
And every school board member that ever runs for school board knows that when you're elected, you have no authority on your own. And so I thought the discussion about authority was appropriate. And I really wish that um, there would have been more discussion. It seemed like Justice Barrett was asking the authority question. And I was just waiting for someone to say, in this particular case, a school board member as an individual has no authority to do anything. In California, a school board takes action only at a properly noticed and appropriately agendized meeting. Any school board member can say anything or do anything that they want to, but it has no authority to speak on behalf of the board. And there's even case law and statutory law in California that says the members of the public are put on notice when dealing with school boards and members of school boards that they do not have, the burden is on the members of the public to know that you're not dealing with someone with authority. You have to deal with the entire school board speaking through its majority at a properly noticed meeting for there to be any authority. So um, I wished we would have seen more of that. And I felt like Justice Barrett was trying to get there, but I, nobody picked it up and ran with it. And so I thought that was very important uh, and that was briefed in our brief. And uh, the other comment about, uh, one of you said that you weren't sure if you, you hadn't read all the briefs, but the proximity or the number of times or places where you can get the information. We talked a lot about that too, because um, school board members are, they're private individuals who've been elected to serve on a board. It's completely different than the, the President Trump, constitutional office with inherent authority in that office. A governor is the same way. Uh, they have power to do something on their own. Uh, school board members have no power to do anything on their own. They can take a complaint from someone and say they're gonna fix it, but they don't have authority to fix it. It has to go to the superintendent or the entire school board. And so the facts of that case, I guess what I was struck with was the fact that the court didn't care anything about the facts. They were concerned about coming up with a test that could be applied across the board in the future, rather than, and this came out in the back and forth a couple of times with both parties, well, we know you wanna win your case, but, and then, oh yeah, and we know you wanna win your case, but. Um, I think the school board case really turns on the fact that the school board member has no authority to do anything, or to speak as a state actor and, um, if they actually read all the briefs and get dig into the California law, I think that's a no brainer. But um, anyway, it was it was a very interesting discussion. I enjoyed it. And the fact that um, I think Kavanaugh was was very good at trying to get to the point of where can you find this information somewhere else? School board members are notorious for posting information about their school district, but it's all on the district website. And under California law, it has to be on the school district website. Every school district has a website and they have requirements as to what they have to put on there and school board members put it all on there as well. So how can that be state action? Uh, you may become a habit of going to the school board members site, but it's also on the school district website. And I think that is a really important fact and should be something that they can hinge their opinion on. Okay, um, so Donna, since you filed the petition or your, uh, I mean, what'd you take from the argument? How, how's, without obviously disclosing anything, but how, how's the team feeling in general about what, what we learned today? Um, it's, I mean, everyone knows that it's always difficult to read the tea leaves from argument. Um, I thought, I mean, first I thought it was really, really interesting to listen to both cases be argued and get any the questions and everything that came up and what is really, really thorny issues. Uh, as, as was evident from everyone's question and even some confusion, I think, between the threshold question and the merits. Um, I think the justices indicated discomfort with both sides um, of the story. And um, I agree with, I think you said earlier that it seems like they may go for something in the middle. Um, again, it's you know, they, they're good at being vague and they're good at being at playing devil's advocate. So I, I'm not going to, to make a prediction, but um, I think they most definitely express discomfort with both kind of the extremes. Okay, um, and Tori? Um, yes, I thought, uh, what I thought most 
was the most interesting was Justice Kavanaugh's questions. So piggyback off of Peter, I thought he had some really good questions um, about the reposting, which is 100% my case. And what I, I really thought was interesting that I thought the facts did matter, especially in the OCR argument, um, because I, I thought that the justices really focused on the facts of my case a lot during the OCR argument, uh, which I was surprised by. Um, but they, it, and I think it was Justice Kagan at some point who really said, uh, she gave him a question and said, you know, this guy's got, have you looked at the record here? There's most of his dog is takeout food. He's got Bible verses on there. I mean, this page is inherently a uh -oh. personal page. <laughs> <laughs> a Bible verse, right, right. I mean, he does, because I mean, he treated it as his personal page. First, so yeah. if if he has those Bible verses on his page, that's that's a concern if this is on behalf of the government. And uh, I just, I thought I was surprised by how much, how many of my facts were being used in their case. So I do think that the facts do matter to them. And that was my my biggest takeaway. Um, I also thought that the conversation about custom, I got a few questions about this. Um, is interesting because it hasn't, the custom in 1983 hasn't been litigated that much. So um, my response was the addicts case, which I, there's not much else to go on. It was, that's a hard question to answer. And I, I really, other than that case, didn't have a lot to go off of. So I, I appreciated their concern about that, but it was, those were tough questions to answer. Yeah. What, um, one other thing that struck me is sort of what the stakes are. So the, the justices appeared to be very concerned that if we find state action on a, on a private account in, in, in one way or the other, then the logical consequence is the government can then start to direct that public official about the content of their private social media, and that can't be right. Um, I just, I wonder if that is that a fortiori? In other words, is, is that, Bob, you're shaking your, I, I, it struck me as a Brit, you know, not necessarily true, but you, you have a view, I can see. Well, I, I, I just thought that whole approach was, was pretty disingenuous because to argue that public officials are somehow limited in their First Amendment rights when they conduct public affairs on their personal pages, the answer to that is simple don't mix the two, right? If you wanna have a personal um, Facebook uh, page, have that. Post your dog pictures there, post your kid pictures there, take pictures of your food, do whatever you want. But once you start conducting public business through your private account, then you run the risk that it's going to be considered state action. Now, in the context of these cases, it isn't a question of whether or not the government is going to come in Garcetti versus Sabalo style and start dictating what is on those pages. Uh, the only issue is whether or not they can continue to indiscriminately um, um, uh, either delete um, uh, posters or postings from people who post things on their websites. And by the way, there are no damages involved in these cases, right? It's really just a question of whether or not they're going to be required to treat their public forum section under constitutional rules and allow postings by people they don't want to have to post. Uh, so I, I don't see any real risk that public officials' First Amendment rights to speak are going to be limited in any way. It simply means that if they want to have a personal page, they have their personal page, costs nothing. Um, and then if they want to have their um, official page, have an official page. Yeah, I, I think the one thing is it's a bit too simplistic to say, well, if it's pictures of the dog or the cat, then it's personal. And if it's about public policy, then it's then it's governmental because what that leaves out is that public officials also have a First Amendment right to speak about matters of public concern and to speak about matters of public policy. So, mm -hmm. if a senator wants to say on his personal page, you know, I support net neutrality or I'm against net neutrality, and that's because he wants people to, to vote for him or to, or to support his candidacy or whatever. That's not that doesn't isn't trans, doesn't transform the page into state action just because you talk about the yeah, public matter. But, but campaign pages have been treated as private and not as, as uh, the conducting of public affairs. For now. I, I don't think they have to be. So our amicus brief actually takes the position that um, that, uh, that there are other types of uh, narrow speech limitations that apply to candidates because they recognize interests of the voter and access to information. So things like Buckley v. Vallejo's campaign finance limitations apply to 
officials who are only campaigning who have not yet been elected as much as they do to someone who is seeking re-election for a particular position. So I, I, um, I also wanna you know, flag that I, I think there's an important question to about who bears uh, the burden, um, not just, you know, um, you know, particularly in terms of incentivizing a bright line, um, not only the ease with which you spoke about being able to split up pages, but the efforts of having to litigate these issues. It would require individuals to have to file lawsuits uh, in order, you know, to know whether or not a staffer developed a certain post, in order to know whether government computers are being used, um, relying on something like appearance purpose that lay folks can see when they access the page, whether or not a government email address is being utilized, whether or not, uh, you know, there are photos uh, that are indicative uh, of announcements and policies and some of the other matters that were discussed. I think thinking about some of those uh, you know, uh, not only litigation burdens, but incentives uh, to avoid risk and liability are also an important part of the conversation and line drawing, um, but also really prioritizing the public's interest and in access to information. So, one, Jennifer, one, I'm, I'm pleased yeah, that ahead. you brought up the litigation issue because uh, counsel for respondents, uh, Ms. Carlin, who I think uh, was very commanding today, she advocates a rule that there is a rebuttable presumption that anything a state official ever says anywhere is state action. We're excited she might have read our brief because that I, is not how I read her initial, some of the initial positions in the, the written briefs, but the, the amicus that I'm talking about was uh, co-authored with um, Duke, Arizona, and Illinois' First Amendment programs and signed on to by SMU Tulane, as well as individual scholars. And in some cases, some of the uh, some of our group's clients uh, who are navigating these issues. So uh, we advocate for that kind of rebuttable presumption standard, which I think was kind of an evolution in the argument from, from the clear Garnier um, uh, and, and Linky standards where, you know, they're um, they're kind of only talking about appearance and purpose and not actually the presumption. So I, I was really excited to hear that and would love to hear more of your thoughts on how you saw that in context. I'm here as chief of staff and senior vice president of CCIA, <laughs> and therefore I have no opinion. <laughs> <laughs> One other consequence of whatever decision they make, but the Garnier case in particular, the current Ninth Circuit, creates an inherent disparity in elections. Um, and you could call it election influence, I don't know. But as for incumbent school board members, they have to allow all comments. They can't hide anything and they can't block anyone. That's if true. you're no, running against sure. them, if you're running against them, uh, unless you block everyone, it's not what you're no, doing. No, you unless have you have a, a campaign page. <laughs> if you have if campaign you're using page. your page, if you're using your page as a personal and saying you went to school and you visited a classroom or whatever. And you've, under that Ninth Circuit, you've created this forum that people can take it over, which is what happened there. And 400 and some comments or 200 and some comments in a 10 minute period, they got blocked and then uh, hid and then blocked. And then they got sued and said, no, you can't do that. Um, the inherent disparity is that someone running who's not an incumbent doesn't have to allow anything they don't want on their page. They have, can have a pristine, crystal clean campaign page or personal page that they use as a campaign page. And then you put that up against an incumbent who has to allow other people to post things that they don't like. Um, but that, it creates I think a disparity. That, I think that makes sense though, because once you become a public official, I mean, unfortunately, and maybe fortunately, there are some things that you give up. And then once you become a public official, that brings in the push and pull between your First Amendment rights and those of the public. If I'm just a private citizen, even if I'm running a campaign, I'm not yet at the point at which I have given something up in return for what I get for representing a constituency. But yeah, in return for what you get, school board members would say they get a lot of grief and, no, and really nothing else. But yes, thank um, you for your service. But, <laughs> but um, I guess such is life. Yeah, it is. Um, but it creates an inherent disparity about what your online presence looks like. 
well, as, as a challenger versus an incumbent. But that's and, entirely under your control because if you have a page that is clearly identified as your candidate's page, that is not state action. The Eighth Circuit has held that. That's not the issue involved in this case where you have people who are basically running school board business on their, on their personal pages. And if you have a personal page that is clearly a personal page, you're talking about your pets, you're talking about your birthday parties, that's not a government speech, even if it is a public official, a government actor who owns that page. It's only when you mix those functions that you run the risk of it being treated as state action, and particularly when you're inviting public comment. One, one point, too, that makes this sort of a confusing issue is the whole we've talked about the issue of public forums. And uh, Stephanie was mentioning, too, that this is the sort of trap that uh, the CTI. I was wondering how long we go before <laughs> public and, 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 and I agree that uh, you should not be treating the platforms as state actors. They're not state actors, they're private actors with their own First Amendment interests and rights. Um, the issue here is when public officials use those private platforms for public purposes, when that becomes state action. And then it's a question of line drawing, which test you apply. But if you're clearly not operating as or not using your private platform to conduct public business, then this case shouldn't worry you. Either of these cases should. May I add just a wrinkle? Nobody owns their page. Well, that's right. <laughs> well, well, we, can, that's that's what general, we can talk about that. That's why the property <laughs> right thing didn't make sense. I mean, exactly. I, I kept thinking, you don't own the page, but you control the page. Um, and it's really a question of control versus ownership is what it seemed like to me. Usage. So can I, one, um, I guess I've got two, but this one, I, I don't know where this takes me. I, I teach an internet law class and, and uh, you know, one of the themes in the class is, you know, uh, <clears throat> is this the kind of issue where we need an internet specific rule or should the general law be able to apply to the internet? Um, and I felt like I wasn't ready to argue for an internet specific rule, but I, I was a little troubled by all of the analogies being offline, like that the, the public yeah. official is, is talking to people at the farm. And we, we spent a lot of time talking about the farm. Um, and, and then on the other hand, Justice Kavanaugh is like, okay, let's live in the real world for a minute. I'm the White House press secretary. I invite my favorite journalists over for dinner and we talk business. Um, is that state action? And of course, the justices know that that's part of how Washington works. So the answer has to be no to that hypothetical. Um, but then, so how do you explain that? Um, and uh, and there, I think the, the the question was, well, what's the? Is there some official channel of communication that you know it should be more official? But social media blurs these distinctions and social media creates a new capacity for members of the public to interact with public officials that they never had before. And so the stakes of being cut off from that strike me as stakes that don't translate well into the offline world, but I'd love responses to that observation. <laughs> I don't think this case is about the right to access your government. That should come from the government itself. If the city of Port Huron wanted to have a more online presence, then it should be the city council telling the city manager, hey, we want to open up this forum, not use your personal Facebook account. But if I can just, but I want to talk to the city manager and the place where the city manager seems to be available is on their personal website where they're talking a lot of city business uh, specifically in my case that's not accurate from the record no, I, at understand. All. I'm not, but I don't want to do your specific case I want to say there's a city manager out there I've got a local issue I noticed that if you comment on their social media your local issue might get addressed it's like it becomes the 311 uh, it's an unofficial sort of 311 channel uh, but I have another dispute with the city manager and they've decided to block me and now I've actually got an issue on my block and I want to talk to them about it, but I've been cut off from this channel that no one else has. And it just feels like that's different from not being invited to the barbecue. And, and I, I, I didn't get it. It's still an I additive, think that, right? It's, I'm not going to use it. It's an additive avenue for discourse with a public official. And I think that matters. 
because again, if we take the view from the constituents and their rights to petition the government, mm -hmm. is it then the case that some citizens have more rights than others? Because some citizens' mayors run their Facebook page and others don't. And then does that become constitutionally cognizable that constituents whose mayor does not understand social media have fewer rights to petition the government? I, I think the exclusivity issue is extremely salient. I, again, I wish I'd had gotten more more attention uh, because we are all human beings who perform any number of duties, usually at the same time, certainly it seems in, in this town. And it is it becomes so fact intensive that the litigation would, would, would crush each and every one of us. And I think focusing more on where you're speaking and whether there was another place for citizens to petition their government and to read their government's words, it matters in this context. Otherwise, everything is going to end up being state action because there are lots of public officials and lots of X accounts out there. Well, that goes I, back to the whole authority issue. On the school board case and the city manager case, neither one of them have any authority on their own. The public's right to petition their government is through the city council or the school board. It's not through an individual. And so, that right hasn't been messed with at all. And just why, to, why are we talking just about the right to petition the government? What yeah. About just what about just the, the free free speech in general? Yeah, I'm trying, to, this, right to free speech. I'm trying to complicate this the, a little bit because both of them, but the citizen also. I mean, I think that some of this is kind of begging the question because the whole question is, it's not. I don't think that anyone would argue that if that that all of a sudden now we all have a right to approach our public officials of every level on social media. But I think part of the question that we were trying to answer today is, did they put themselves in a position where they establish an official or a seemingly official line of communication such that they are a public official purporting to act in an official capacity and therefore they are possibly liable for interfering with speech? We're just going back to the original question. I also think there are multiple ways that communication flows. So one is from public officials to members of the public, and that has important consequences, again, in the day-to-day -day lives of people. One of the examples we reference in our brief is about uh, an individual who was blocked from the school board's page and didn't know about bus transportation in light of weather and whether or not to send his elementary school daughter out in the dark at 6 a.m. to go wait for a school bus because the only place that information was posted was on that account. Um, I also think though there is the the petition element where individuals are communicating directly with officials. There are many examples, including in a case we're litigating in Tennessee against a state representative where there are requests for voting on different policy options and inviting the public for commentary, um, not just about any specific issue, but on matters of uh, general public importance. And then there's the third prong, which is communication between citizens themselves. So even if the elected official opened up the Facebook page, uh, had one post and then only just let comments flow from there, the right of citizens to engage with an, one another is itself also an important speech protection within these spaces. And so I agree with the characterization that once any place is opened up um, for that kind of public use, that it uh, requires viewpoint discrimination protection. I will say, I, I think that's going to the merits and I have not expressed an opinion on the merits. <laughs> okay. I mean, okay. I not the merits, but I, on so, state action, yes. So let me circle back to this other issue about, uh, so, so the court's going to give us a test, and it's a Goldilocks test. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have some magic words the lower courts are going to have to apply. Um, and then the question is, what does the test apply to? Um, and so for a while we heard, it, 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 well, it applies when the um, public official is essentially established a channel that would be one option right that it when it when it's a it's applied to an established channel uh the other is it applies to the entire account it can apply post by post um and so the solicitor general for example said you could have an otherwise entirely private account but if the public official decides to conduct notice and comment that becomes state action uh it was, seemed like a strange hypothetical but okay i'll, I'll accept it so uh, so the justices in the first argument were really focused on that, and then it sort of uh, it, it went away a little bit. But did you come away with any sense of what the 
what's the level of generality at which this test will apply? It's difficult, I think, because some of the, this is sort of a unit of analysis type question, right? Um, and it goes back a little bit to, to what the Supreme Court has instructed you are to look at when it comes to state action, right? So sort of the narrow action that was taken. Um, and so if you are blocked from a page, so you have to look at being blocked from a page and that kind of makes a bigger unit of analysis versus if your comment was deleted, that's a smaller unit of analysis. Um, but I think that something that appearance or function does just to sort of why I think the difficult is the question becomes difficult, especially in that realm, is that when you think of appearance and function, you immediately think about the entire page. And so that is where things become thorny. Um, and I think that ultimately there is a bunch of other hypotheticals that could be even more difficult. And um, Alon, who argued for our client, talked about that at the end of his rebuttal, which is there are other ways that you can exclude someone from the page that are more sophisticated than social media. And that I think would generate a whole, just a whole host of unit of analysis problems that the, the justices are not did not grapple with and are not going to have to grapple with. And thank goodness, because I, I don't think, I think it's too complicated even for me. Um, so I, I think that's something that's going to be difficult. I'm, I'm not really answering your question. I'm more just saying. Well, that you're, I mean, it, it sounds like it depends on the, okay. I think that the justices walked in knowing they were never going to arrive at an absolute standard, a bright line test with no fact investigation at all. They're, they're trying to find their level. I will say that uh, Mr. Mupan's argument that if a page is mixed use, even if it's 1% personal, 99% public facing or involved in public discourse, then it's immediately not state action. I, Hats off to him for making that argument. Uh, it's pretty brave. I don't think the justices would go there. Um, you know, I began life as a telecom lawyer, and there's something called the uh, contamination rule. And the rule is, if it's if there's traffic going over the network and 10% of it is interstate, then the whole thing is deemed interstate. I think it's very scary to apply a test like that to speech. So uh, I don't think they. I, I would think they would love to do account by account analysis. That's not going to happen. I think it is going to be post by post. And what troubles me more is who is it, it's in the eye of the beholder, but who who's the beholder? Um, as as um, Peter uh, right. stated, the burden is important. Is it going to be the complainant's burden to demonstrate that the defendant is a state actor, or is it? the state actors or the, the, the officials burden uh, to rebut state action. I think that will answer 90% of the problem here. And uh, they may well put the burden on the official. I think that they were looking for a way for complainants to be heard in court. Yeah, and on that point, the, I'm sorry, the other uh, issue, and it, it goes a little bit to that is, is the disclaimer, uh, you know, could, and so in intellectual property law, this comes up a lot in trademark and in the, in the in, in Justice Jackson in particular was concerned about in trademark law, we'd call it consumer confusion. Like, and, and the question is whether a disclaimer uh, in the trademark context is I am not affiliated with that other brand that looks similar to me. Is that effective legally to, to clear up the confusion? And here I think Justice Jackson it, it, it might end up coming into the presumption, like as I saw the ne negotiation going on, it's possible that the disclaimer and the, and the presumption might start to merge. But I, I think the proposition Justice Jackson was pushing on was, look, it's your account. And if you wanna stay clear of the state action doctrine, then you should make it clear to the public that I'm not acting in my official capacity. But if you want to ambiguate the situation and dress yourself in the color of the state on your private account, 
then you might have to bear the consequence of being treated as the states and it's up to you. And a lot of the pushback was, well, now you're compelling the public official on what they can and have to say on their private account. And that's where the presumption might come in. We're not compelling anything. We're just saying you have a choice, but the presumption might affect that choice. So any thoughts about the disclaimer or what I just said in terms of where I saw some of the uh, sort of positions in the argument moving? Well, one thing that's interesting about that is at the federal level, a lot of pages do have disclaimers because usually people who are uh, federal officials will have an official account that's denominated as such. They'll have a personal account that's denominated as such, and then they'll have a campaign account that's denominated as such. And they might also have like other you know, campaign related accounts uh, you know, for, for, for other entities. And they're all marked that way. Now, the question is, do people dig far enough into the site to see it. So, I mean, I think that just raised a whole host of other questions about how, how prominent is the disclaimer. And if it becomes very prominent, it starts to take over the speech. And, you know, I, I, I don't see them going that way, but, you know, maybe they will. The and disclaimer goes to the question of appearance, but it doesn't go to the question of function. What is the website being used for? And if it's being used to conduct public business, then it doesn't matter whether you're saying, but this is an official website. That'll just be another factor. But it, it's true that you have uh, folks, particularly members of Congress, have both their official sites and then they have their personal sites. And uh, as uh, was just mentioned, uh, you know, they'll have their campaign sites as well. And to that extent, whether or not you have a disclaimer isn't compelling anyone to speak. It's simply differentiating the, the, the different sites and what they're used for. Um, well, I have other questions, but I want to go ahead and invite members of the audience if, if you have any uh, questions. So I wanted to ask a question about um, control. Um, and this was kind of discussed a little bit earlier, but so with the Trump case, uh, Twitter later suspended his account. And I was wondering if there was like some discussion about that tension, like it feels very strange that this page was treated as official by the administration and then was you know suspended by Twitter after um, January 6th that came up yeah Justice Thomas, Justice Thomas, Thomas yeah, that a few times in, the, about that. in a question to the solicitor general in our case basically how does that bear on your argument this is private property um, if it's something that one the, the government does not own, and the Solicitor General took the position that actually uh, and strengthens their position, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, but it goes to that point where we were talking about earlier where platforms are private uh, and they've been recognized uh, as such. And as a consequence, they have their own First Amendment rights to decide what kind of communities they want to foster, what kinds of moderation rules they'll have. And so that's a, a separate question. And that lies behind the ability to cancel the account even of a former president uh, if those rules are perceived to be violated. Um, and then this really is a sort of a second level state action question of the use by public officials on those sites, whether or not they are um, uh, subject to the restrictions that would apply if they were acting as government. I thought it was interesting that the Solicitor General said that strengthens our argument because it seems to run counter to the whole property argument. It does. Because it's not property if someone else owns it and they can delete the account. But it does support the argument that it's not state action because some other company that actually owns the site apparently can decide to cancel at any time. So it, there's some tension in their argument there. And I think they were saying it, it enhances our argument on the one hand, but I think, think it undercuts the private property argument on the other. Yeah, I actually thought that made, that made some sense because, um, you know, if you think about, you know, to go back to the physical world examples, you know, campaign rallies or something like that, where you rent a hotel ballroom or stadium or whatever, I mean, you don't own that, that venue, but you have the right to exclude. And so I think, I, I think that's where the, where the SG was trying to go with that, which I, I thought made some sense. Well, that makes sense in the campaign context. If you're running a campaign and you only want, want to invite Republicans or Democrats to your 
you know, uh, Waldorf Astoria yeah. event. Waldorf Astoria sets their own rules for ballroom use, and you set your own rules for who you invite. But if you have a um, public town square meeting at the Waldorf Astoria as a mayor or as you know a public official, then it becomes a different issue for well, That just seems square. to get back to the first question. That's right? what so these cases are. <laughs> <That's your second. laughs> yeah. And it, there are layers of authority, yeah. The content of the speech might carry the weight and force of authority, even though the speaker can get evicted from the place where they are speaking. And so I, I don't think it's dispositive of the issue, the fact that X canceled Donald Trump's account. It's, if, if I were a, a complainant, I would say it doesn't matter the words that Donald Trump were using carried the force of law. So I don't think that ownership of the vehicle of speech is dispositive of the issue, whether it's state action. Property just shouldn't be part of this. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, I think point... he was trying to make a nice uh, metaphor and then realized it was not Justice Thomas? No, Mupan opened with that. Opened oh, with the, with the ballroom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I thought we were going back to the question. But... So I think your point is so true. And so one of the first things I said was that what was being said there carried the force and weight of law. That's the president. It's a constitutional position, has some authority. In the two cases that were heard today, you have a city manager and an individual school board member. Neither one of them have that. And that's in a statute or the constitution. Yes. Well, yeah, an well, objective leader. Of, so of this is but this, right. let me, this is one of the complicating factors that, um, uh, so, okay, sure. If, if, if you do the narrow version of the Sixth Circuit test and, and define authority in that way, I agree. But um, duty got a lot of work out. And one of the questions was, is it in part of the public official's duty to either gather information from members of the public or communicate with members of the public? Um, and when do we say that they're exercising such duty? Uh, and when are they simply at the grocery store and they happen to be talking work or something like that? And how do you differentiate between a duty to communicate or a duty to listen and simply doing that as, as, as a person in the world? Um, and that seems like the hard piece of this is, is that, you know, there are lots of other aspects of a public official's uh, responsibilities where we could probably draw clearer lines, but, but this, the, the need to communicate in, in, as an official uh, seemed to be the most complicating fact. And I'm wondering, um, you know, does duty, how, if they go with some modified version of duty and authority, what do they do with this issue in terms of duty? But that goes back to the question you asked earlier about using real world examples, brick and mortar examples to deal with social media and whether or not it necessarily applied. And Justice Kagan toward the end of the argument got to this, but she said, you know, we're in a new world here. People are conducting a lot of democracy online. And I don't know if we can resolve this question by asking about whether or not a public official ran into someone at the grocery store. Uh, and, and so I think it, it does make a difference when someone actively uses a channel of communication for communication with constituents, two-way communication with constituents, and then selectively uses it to allow some communication and not others. Now we can talk about the particular cases and whether or not the facts add up to conducting public business. And that's where a lot of the discussion was today. But I don't think that you resolve the question by simply saying, well, yeah, public officials in life interact with people. Here they are using a medium of communication to do that. And one that has been recognized as increasingly used in our democratic system. And so the question is, how do you manage that and allow public officials to selectively exclude speakers they don't like? I think duty here is important and that's why I didn't uh, want duty and authority to be collapsed. And I, I think it almost might've been by the end of the argument. And I believe it matters. There's a state action is, is, is a, a multi-criteria examination. And one of the criteria not discussed at least today, is the traditional government function test. 
is the conduct undergone something that is a traditional public function? And I think that is why the duty to speak to constituents or to be heard by constituents matters because it can't only be the force of the words. There should be a cognizable tether to the reason the person is speaking. If it is a frolic and detour, that's one thing. If it's, and this is outlandish to me, I hope it's not true, but if it's running a notice and comment administrative rulemaking off of your Facebook page, uh, that notice and comment action is a traditional public function. I hope that traditional public function does play some role in the, in the test. The Solicitor General brought up a lot, the exclusive public function is sort of part of their test, but, I, but that is a concept that's imported from cases that the Supreme Court decides on whether a private party is, is a state actor. And so I think that cannot be the, start, the starting point in this case. Right. I think it always matters if you're talking about a human being vis-a-vis -vis an office, if it's for your, or as opposed to an office. Because human be beings, as I had said before, have lots of different functions. And being at the grocery store is different than acting as the mayor at a town council meeting. And so there, there still does lie some need to discern the purpose of the speech at issue. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to figure out here. Not just authority, but is it tethered to a legally prescribed purpose? So I've got another one, but any other? So this is, I, I, I kept feeling frustrated by some of the hypothetical, like, uh, because the other, to me, like, what you want the hypothetical and or oral argument to do is to be testing the limits of a position. And, and one of the things, other, one of the other ways in which officials interact with the public, um, but can be selective is, um, is in the grant of certain benefits. So, so, and Tori, I don't know if you want to, or Donna, if you, I don't know if you want to answer this hypothetical, but, but <laughs> I, I was trying to imagine, and again, I'll just do sort of inside the beltway, but, you know, we're coming up to the holiday season, and, and during the holiday season, one of the things that's nice is to get an invitation to go to the White House to see the decorations. Um, and sometimes you can get that invitation through your con congressional office if, if the White House is granted that. So in my hypothetical, a member of Congress has received, you know, 50 tickets to the White House to see the decorations. Um, and they decide that instead of using it in the normal way of, you know, I'll, I'll pay off my supporters and that sort of thing, I'm gonna run a lottery. And any constituent in my district uh, can play the lottery and whoever wins will get the tickets. But I have excluded 10 people uh, from accessing my uh, Facebook. So they won't be able to get the benefit. They are excluded because I've, I've excluded them from the place in which I am giving them. And the only reason I have these tickets is because I'm a member of Congress. I got, these are, you know, so, and I'm giving them out to you as your member of Congress. Uh, and I am excluding the opportunity to get this benefit because I, it's on my social and I can do that. State action or not? I think going to the Christmas tree of First Amendment activity. So we're talking now about First Amendment. Right? Yeah, but I, well, but I just, no, but that's the problem is we're only talking about state action. We're not doing public forum. We're not doing all the other good stuff. We're just saying state action. And I, it's, I, to me, that was troubling that the issue got narrowed to that point because there are other gates that you're going to have to go through to make a successful claim. I would want to know more facts about the page and why you excluded from it because the example of the lottery is just one of the things that those individuals are prevented. Unless in your hypothetical you excluded them right before and just for purpose of preventing them from participating in the lottery. No, I excluded them because they were commenting, making critical comments, and I, I didn't want to hear from them anymore. And what does your page look like? It's no, it's a pretty official page. It's you know, I've done a lot of official things on it, but but I've I've under this duty and authority uh, test. I'm uh, normally it's not state action, but now I'm handing out a a benefit that I to my constituents in my official capacity through my Facebook page. Is that a benefit to which your constituents have a legal right? No. But I am doing it because well, of a member of Congress. I, I think the question, I think that the state action just comes earlier. 
at the exclusion from the page. And exactly. then I would say yes, and whether it's permissible, that's a merits question. And what matters is why you excluded them. And if you're excluding them because question. of their criticism, then it Does your answer change you if, if this is the only event. official thing I've done? It's been my private, uh, everything else is dog pictures and kids. But I've just decided on a lark, this is how I'm gonna interact with my constituents and this is the channel in which I'm gonna interact with them just on this transaction. But, and you excluded them because you're interacting, you're, you're, you're um, doing this lottery? Yeah. Yeah, the question would be whether or not you can describe the public benefit, the thing that you're giving away is actually a government function. So, I mean, you may have those, those things, those tickets to the White House to give away just because you're a member of Congress, but that doesn't mean that what you're performing is a government function or giving a government benefit like a welfare check. Is it prescribed by law? Is it something people are entitled to? In this country, people are entitled to free speech. That's what these cases are about. I don't think there is a cognizable right to, you know, special tickets. If there were, there'd be a lot of congressmen and set senators in trouble because well, they I hand out, you know, they get those white, <clears throat> they get those White House uh, tour tickets, yeah, and and they don't put them to lottery. I, I, I don't think the lottery is evidence of harm, right? If if someone is being excluded from the page and then is not on equal footing with other citizens simply because of viewpoints that they have expressed. Yes. In that's the past, the, then the I uh, then I would say that the uh, the uh, the limitation on the lottery is the harm. That is an example of something you're excluded from. Just like you're excluded from news, you're excluded from conversation. I think that's an example of the manifest injustice, but that the the state action comes at the point of exclusion. Okay. I'm wondering if there's what you think the possibility is that two cases might be resolved differently. You know, one might win, one might lose. Um, I know that Justice Kagan was saying that she thought the first um, page was more of a public page, <coughs> page and the second case was more of a private facing page. But do you think, I mean, it's based on the facts. I mean, um, Mr. Kagan seemed to think that the facts mattered a lot. And I think in a lot of the other First Amendment situations like student speech, high school cheerleader case, the facts really mean a lot in those cases and the court decides them based on the facts. That, you don't think that's gonna happen here? It, if they possible. get to the facts, they can also just come up with the test and remand. Yeah, and I got the impression, and again, this is just my impression, I'm sitting there and listening, that they were, really trying to come up with a test that would apply across the board. Um, that seemed to be the whole focus of the questions. Uh, and it seemed like there, there could be two, three different tests that people were coming up with. And you know, I don't know if they'll get to a majority on a particular test or not, we'll see. Uh, but you could, you certainly could see a different result because uh, I don't see them drawing a percentage line, but they did throw out the percentage that 95-5. Um, 90, 95% personal and 5% public, is that state action or not? But then you look at the school board members and, and what you have, three posts that were personal and the rest were all uh, related to her activities. I'll say activities, not duties, as a school board member. Yeah. It's conceivable they could come to different conclusions in the, new, the two cases, depending on what kind of tests they adopt. And sometimes they do split the difference like in Counterman versus Colorado last year, the case involving the definition of true threats, where the court adopted a position advanced by the Solicitor General, but not advanced by either party, uh, applying a reckless disregard standard for mens rea for finding true threats and not either an objective or a totally subjective standard. Um, and it was, a, it was a position that was advocated in like three pages toward the end of the Solicitor General's brief. So sometimes the court will reach for a solution that isn't wholly satisfactory to either side, or in this case, it might split the difference between the two cases, but it's hard to know without having a good handle on what test they're going to adopt. Yeah. We got a question in the back. So, uh, and I know you don't love the real world, real world hypotheticals, but I think as a, as a public official myself, um, listening to some of the examples today, they seem to go back and forth and some of the justices would explain real world examples that would be 
completely acceptable as a public official, right? So as a council member, I could invite any limited amount of constituents to a, to a meeting to discuss items of public policy and items I'm considering as part of public policy and limit who I invite, really based on anything I want, whether it be color, whether it be, you know, any, if I have a group of people that I've decided that I want to invite, and I don't name the reason, it could happen. And I could have that meeting in a place that is relatively public. For example, let's say at a restaurant. And if I did that, and just as a, again, plain hypothetical example, uh, Ms. Orr's client came to the restaurant and saw me in an appearance of, of, and function of a public official having a meeting that he decided he should participate in and started harassing me from across the room and we closed the doors of that restaurant. That's no different than a Facebook page. No, no that's the opposite of such situation. Mm -hmm. You're talking about inviting a select group. These cases are about well, disinviting people. Mm -hmm. If you're From already open, but closing to the, the doors would be a question of degree. You have a set of invitees, and then you exclude one invitee. It doesn't matter if it's your entire constituent or a hundred of them. It's the idea of can you exclude anybody if you're doing something that could be construed as state action? Is that exclusion a violation of a cognizable right? And I, I just question how it would be even possible for someone like my client to figure out that you were acting in an official capacity if you're just wearing plain clothes and having a dinner at a restaurant with a few people. You're well, not from how small or <laughs> I, I use it as an example because it happens <laughs> with your client. Yeah. Um, I, I can offer another example. Let's say there is a press event happening. It is a limited room. There are say only 20 journalists allowed in. At some point, there might be more than 20 journalists who are interested, but if the way that people are let into that room is based on viewpoint or excluded is as a result based on viewpoint, that would be impermissible under the First Amendment. The White House press corps, one of the members got his card revoked and he challenged it based on right. what he thought was viewpoint. I, I was part of that case for Pen, Pen America, yeah. and although uh, President Trump left office before that case could be resolved. Uh, his motion to dismiss was denied because the denial of the press pass was uh, considered to be an official act. And uh, so we never got to discovery, sadly. Right. But uh, yeah, I, I, I just say that to narrow down on the problem of viewpoint discrimination as the First Amendment offense, at recognizing that there are situations where, you know, especially in the physical world, there might be some of those limits, but, uh, you know, really hearkening on what you've said about how in the digital space, there are none of those kinds of trade-offs that need to be made. And so when you exclude by viewpoint, I think it's just that much more distilled and problematic. All right. So on that note, we're going to, we've hit time and we have students who will be coming into the room in a little bit. So we're going to close. Let me ask you all to thank our panelists for their great contribution. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And uh, we do have a light reception outside and I hope you can enjoy that. And happy Halloween, everyone. Happy Halloween. <laughs> we have decorated for the occasion.